Clancy. And now I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Susan Clancy. She, Susan is an associate professor at NCHI Business School in Organizational Behavior and also research director for NCHI Center on Women's Leadership. She's a consultant throughout the region for Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, multilaterals, and her current research includes human performance in the workplace, strategic talent management, employment equity, and diversity strategy. Susan? I made it. Thank you very much. OK. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Good? OK. I'm here, and I'm a little nervous, because usually I have my PowerPoint, which is like a safety thing, and I don't have it. I'm just going to talk. So I'm going rogue. Um, I'm a professor at Inkai Business School. I do research in the area of women and leadership, and I work a lot with public and private sector organizations, trying to help them identify what the barriers they face, specifically, that are holding you back, and what they can actually do about it, how to design and implement effective strategies to get past these barriers. I think my whole career for the last 20 years has been kind of weird, because if you asked me when I was 30, I would have said there were no barriers. None. I didn't feel any barriers. I went to college. It was half women and half men. I got the jobs I wanted. I got into graduate school. I got a PhD. I was assistant professor at Harvard. It was like a blessed life. And what's interesting is it's the same thing my students are saying now as well. My students, my MBAs at Inkai, and they're saying, there are no barriers. It's equal opportunities. This is a different world than it was in the past. And this scares me because it's not a different world from what it was in the past. Today, we are not making it to the top, just like we never did before. And if we do not understand what exactly these barriers are, that they exist, the only way we find out is when we crash into them. And for me, that is how I discovered the barriers. I discovered them by crashing headlong into them. What happened first? Work-life balance. That's a major barrier you're all facing right now. I was 32, I was married, I had two kids, and it was kind of stressful, because I'm doing most of the work around my house, and my husband and I have the same jobs, and I'm cranky at night, because like, why am I feeding the baby, and why are you studying? But it was okay, I could deal with it, until he got an important promotion that required him to go to Nicaragua. I didn't even know where Nicaragua was. <laughs> he had to go, and if he didn't go, the institution that funded his PhD was going to make him pay back the money, which was $150,000. We didn't even have $150. So this is my issue. Do I follow him to Nicaragua and give up my perfect career at Harvard? I got there as assistant professor, or do I stay alone with my two kids and have an international life with my husband? So what did I do? And I know people will say, you should have been more brave, you should have taken more risks, you should have stayed. Forget that, I had two kids, and I love my husband. What choice do we have? I picked up and I went to Nicaragua. That was barrier one hitting me over the head. Barrier two is what? stereotypes, bias, cultural expectations. I get to Nicaragua and I want to work. That's what I do, I work. And what do they say to me in Latin America? Oh, what's wrong with you? Oh, pobrecitas tus hijas. Oh, mamá, muy complicada. This is it. I, there's something wrong with me because I want to work. But even my mother was saying, honey, this is a time for you to relax. You've worked so hard your whole life. Take care of your nails. Do some yoga. So it's okay, I plow through all that. Guys don't have to plow through, I plow through. And I get a job, and I get a job at Inkai. And Inkai is founded by Harvard Business School and a US State Department grant in the 1960s. And it's a good fit, because it's Harvard, and there are a bunch of academics there. And I said, great. But then guess what? They said, you can have a job, but we want you to study woman stuff. I'm like, what are you talking about? What do you mean women stuff? Well, they said, we need somebody on the faculty who knows about women stuff, leadership, stuff like that. And I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. Like, I'm an experimental psycho psychopathology. You know, like, I, I, I don't want to study women stuff. But I'm a people pleaser, like a lot of women are. 
and they're giving me an opportunity, and I say, okay, whatever, I'll study women's stuff. Now, I have to say right now, I'm glad I did it, because if I didn't do it, I wouldn't be here right now, and if I didn't do it, I wouldn't know what I know, and in a way, it's what a, f a friend of mine who I adore, named Patricia Menendez, who is a partner at Greenberg Trorg, she says, it's an example of what she calls failing upwards. What looks like a mistake at the time, looks like you're a victim of something, you actually can use it for your benefit. I failed up and I got into this important area. And what I want to do is I just want to tell you in the next 15 minutes what I've learned about this topic, the lessons I've learned, and it's related to everything that we're talking about right now. Number one, what I did is I decided not to go into it with the lens of feelings and emotions. I was a scientist and I wanted to go into it looking at data and facts. What did the data say about women in leadership? First of all, was there actually a problem? That was my first question. If so, what was the problem? The problem was clear. The problem is not now a gender diversity problem. Most organizations in the United States, and especially the multinationals in Latin America, have gender diversity. The problem is gender diversity in leadership. You all will make it to middle management positions, and you'll thrive and succeed. But at every subsequent level, you will drop out until when you get to the top, there will almost be none of you there. That is a truth. And what's also a truth is it's not getting better. If you look at recent reports from the ILO, government accountability reports, the number of women in leadership in Fortune 500 companies is actually on the decline. The next thing that I wanted to know is, okay, it is a problem, leadership is still dominated by men. The next thing I wanted to know, forgive me for saying this, I wanted to know why it matters. Who cares? Who cares? So what? I couldn't find a good reason. 15 years ago, I couldn't find a good reason beyond fairness and justice that it mattered why women were important in leadership. In the last 15 years, everything's changed. As Susan has talked about, we're beginning to see that there is a giant and growing body of data clearly indicating that gender diversity in leadership is linked to firm financial performance. When I say firm financial performance, I'm talking about measures like total return to shareholders, return on investment capital, return on equity. This is clear, uncontrovertible. There is data that shows that women, gender diversity in leadership is linked to firm productivity. Gender diversity in leadership is linked to cultural satisfaction levels of employees, which is in turn correlated with decrease in employee attrition rates, and decrease in healthcare spending. So from a private spec sector perspective, there is absolutely no doubt that you are necessary in leadership for an economic imperative. It's not about fairness, it's not about justice, it's because when you're represented in leadership, firms make more money. The thing that's disturbing to me about that is people don't seem to know it. I don't even think you know it. Do you understand how important you are? Do you? Do you understand that as long as your organization has a leadership team completely dominated by men, that organization is not able to perform as well as it could? And I have to say that this business case, this economic imperative, this frame as being an issue of competitiveness and not fairness has to be the front end for any diversity strategy. If your firm or you is talking about fairness, social equality, we want to do what's right, forget it. Don't even bother because you're going to spin wheels and waste money. It has to be framed as an economic imperative. Now, let's move on to the barriers. I have heard so much for 15 years about what you need to do differently. You need to be more assertive. You need to dream bigger. You need to have more courage. You need to just not let anybody say no. You need to find more mentors. You need to network more. You need to manage your time better. You need to get inspired by women who have actually made it. You know what I don't hear? I don't hear what organizations can do 
what has to change within organizations to allow you to thrive. It's all about fixing the woman, but the truth is, 15 years of trying to fix the woman have not made progress. What has to happen now is fix the organization. Imagine a fish. It's a beautiful fish, and you want to make that fish the fastest, smartest, most aggressive fish in the world. So you train your fish, and you feed it right, and you spin it around the bowl and whatever, and you got a great fish. And then you take that fish, and you drop it into a fish bowl that has too much saline. What happens? The fish withers and dies. Right now, the work environment that we're in is the equivalent of an over-salinated fishbowl. Why? Because it's a work environment that was set up for men, by men, in a time when it was only men who worked, and those men had stay-at-home wives. But in the last 50 years, we've seen a sea change, where women, because they're educated and flooding into the workforce, are now 50% of the participants in that workplace. But the policies, the structure, the culture has remained the same. And that's why we're not thriving. So let me make this less specific. Let's talk about what we could actually do involving overcoming your barriers that would focus less on what you need to do and more on what organizational leaders need to do. Number one, let's address the first barrier, work-life balance. Right now, everybody knows women do most of the work around the home. This occurs across culture. Everywhere, every country in the world, women working full-time do most of the work around the home. What else do we know? There are only 24 hours in a day. What else do we know? That a typical job to get to the top requires you to get into a car or a bus or a train and drive our commute on average into a box where you sit in that box for 10 hours a day and then you get out of that box and you get in your car and you drive home. As long as that is how work is done, women will never survive. Not because they don't have the ability, not because they don't have the talent, but because it makes no sense. There are not enough hours in the day. Why is that the culture of work? They call it in academic terms, macho work hours. It doesn't need to be. There's something called technology. Today, all of us can work from wherever we want to work at any time. The panel was discussing this. This is work-life balance. I don't like that term. This is flexibility. This is using technology to allow you control over when and where you work. And when your organization says to you, you work wherever the hell you want, whenever you want, as long as you get your job done, women stay and they thrive. Now, the important thing about this is this technology and work-life balance thing is increasingly, and this is important for all of you to know, something men want as much as women. If you look at surveys from leading institutions, McKinsey, Manpower, et cetera, we're seeing this is the number one non-monetary factor important to men. So this idea of using technology to allow you more flexibility in when and where you work is something you want and something men want. And that means that any firm in the future that hopes to attract, retain, and promote the best talent is going to have to fundamentally change their culture to allow for more work-life flexibility. Does that make sense? So it's not you needing to change, it's your organization needing to change. Number two, let's talk about bias and stereotypes for a second. They exist, we know that, right? We gotta worry about explicit stereotypes. Explicit stereotypes are when a guy says to you, I'm not gonna hire you, you're gonna have two kids in the next five years and you're gonna drop out. That's explicit stereotype. We don't have to worry about that. What we have to worry about is implicit stereotypes. It's the stereotypes that women and men have inside their head that makes it harder for women to be evaluated equally. So you might be working much better and much harder than that guy next to you, but because I associate him with leadership and not you, I see him as being better. Let me give you a fun example of a stereotype. A father and his son are involved in a car accident. This father dies, the son lives, and is brought to the hospital. Upon arriving in the hospital, the head surgeon runs over and says, I can't operate on that boy because he's my son. 
What gender did you originally picture the head surgeon as? If you're like most people, you thought of him as being a man. In fact, a lot of people can't even make sense of what I just said. <laughs> In Panama last week, a guy was like, oh, I know, it's a ghost. A kid in my class in Costa Rica two weeks ago said, yes, they're gay. It's a gay couple. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, it's easier for people to think of the head surgeon as gay or as a, as a ghost than it is to think there's a woman. So it's a funny anecdote, but what I'm trying to tell you is built in inside all of your heads are biases that prevent women from getting evaluated equally. And you know what the only thing you can do about those biases are? You can raise awareness all you want. It doesn't matter. You can't change them. They're freaking locked into your head. The only thing that works is something your organization has to do, and it's called objective performance evaluation systems. When you are being evaluated at every level, those evaluations have to be based on data and information that you can see and prove, and not on people's opinions about whether you'll make a good leader, or whether you're ready for leadership, or whether you have what it takes. A perfect example is professional orchestras. Globally, until 1970, they were only 5% women, and that was because women didn't have the artistic ability. They didn't have the discipline it takes to be great musical artists. In 1970, they started blind auditions. So now, you audition behind a screen, and guess what you have to do? You have to take off your shoes, because women's shoes make a distinctive <laughs> click when they walk across the floor. Today, professional orchestras are almost 40% women. That's objective performance evaluation. And that's what needs to have happen. It's not about you being harder or stronger or better. It's about bias is interfering with your leadership potential being accurately assessed. So in conclusion, I think the main point I'm trying to make is that I'm glad you're all learning about how to network and be strong and dream big. But the truth is, the fastest way to get you into leadership is not to change you, it's to change the organizations that you work for. Because the existing culture and the existing systems doesn't make sense anymore. Now change is hard, and it's expensive, and it's time consuming, and nobody likes it. But you know what else is hard and painful? Being dead. <laughs> and right now, this is no longer an issue of doing what's right. This is an issue of your firm remaining competitive in the 21st century. Right now, as we've been talking about, you are more than 50% of the consumers of any product. You are 80% Latinas in the United States of consumer decision makers in the house. You are 50% of the talent in any organization. And by the way, if we extrapolate into the future, and if the organization is looking for college-educated talent, women are 60% of the potential talent. You are not a diverse group. You don't belong in diversity initiatives, along with people that are handicapped or have different sexual orientations. You are half if not more, of what your organization needs to remain competitive in the future. What does Charles Darwin say about species survival? It is not the species that's the fastest, it's not the strongest, it's not the one that's lived the longest, it's the one that is quickest to adapt for change. And my call out to all of you is to stop the relentless focus on you and what you need to do different and start with a relentless focus on what organizations have to do to make you able to stay in the game. Because we need you in the game, it's an economic imperative.